From the hood to horses. Make sure you put number two. If you put T-O, you probably won't find it. <laughs> number two. Right. Yeah, man. Right, introduce yourself, sir. Uh, so I'm Freedom, uh, Tariq Zampladis. That's Freedom with a double three. That's what we say, yeah. And um, I'm, uh, I'm the CEO of Urban Equestrian. I'm also a community facilitator, the pioneer of Educate Global, which is a community group that I run also. Uh, I'm a business partner in Black Poppy Rose. Um, as you mentioned, I'm an author and uh, and a king. Straight. Okay. So first of all, you come from an Antiguan and Jamaican background. Your mother coming from Jamaica. Your dad born and raised in Antigua. But well, yeah. obviously, you you're from Leicester yourself. So what was it like growing up in Highfields? <coughs> uh, growing up in Highfields. Um, before I left to go on Tiga, you're talking. Um, it was really good. Um, it was really good. I uh, had, had a good time growing up, you know. Um, it was very multicultural. So we had friends with, with uh, you know, uh, kids from all different backgrounds, you know, Asian kids, white kids, mixed race kids, black kids. And um, it was very safe. I would say, for me as a kid, I felt it was very safe. You know, some other parts of England can be quite uh, tricky to live in, in terms of, uh, you know, like racism and stuff like that. You know, though we had that, um, Leicester in itself, in particular where I lived in Highfields, was very multicultural, you know what I mean? So we kind of looked out for each other. We didn't really experience the overt racism that you would get from particular communities, particular people, um, because we weren't really surrounded by those people. We were surrounded by Asian community, African Caribbean community, um, you know, and then uh, the, the white community was kind of the minority, really, in terms of where we lived, you know what I mean? So that's why I say it was quite safe, you know. But when you compare things from like today, yeah. back then, were there a lot of things for you to do as a child in terms of things to get involved with? It's, 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 um, it's quite strange because back then, you know, kids would be playing outdoors, you know what I mean? So we would be at our local park, Spinney Hill Park, nearly every day. Anytime the sun shined, we'd be at our local park, we'd be, um, you know, playing uh, on our bikes, going to the, the adventure playground. Um, you know, doing all that kid stuff that kids kind of don't really do so much nowadays, you know, throwing stones, playing Kirby, knock door run, all them kind of things. You know, I don't see kids doing it so much nowadays, but that was the norm for us, you know. So, was it how you've got a very strong personality and a good presence? Do you feel it was growing up in Highfields or do you think it was a family thing? What do you, how do you feel you've developed that character and the person that you are today? <coughs> the person that I am today? <coughs> The, 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 the main reason in terms of why I am the way I am is really because of my family. Uh, so my dad was a super strong character. He has his own story in relation to his uh, connections to Leicester itself, um, being that he was the pioneer of the Black Power movement here in Leicester. Um, he was also the pioneer of uh, an organisation called Ute Foundation, which was basically a housing project for young black people back in the 70s, uh, particularly young Rastafarians who at the time in the 70s were getting kicked out of their houses due to their affiliation with Rasta, you know, in terms of going back to the Caribbean, you know, you're either Christian or Rasta kind of thing, you know what I mean? And, us as a people in relation to Christianity, we're not very friendly, or back then, 
we weren't very friendly to Rastafarians. So what was happening was that young people who, who, who was following the Rastafarian movement, they were getting kicked out by their parents, kicked out of the houses. So what my dad did, he set up an organisation called Youth Foundation, which was where these same young people could go to this place and get accommodation. You know, so he set that up and as a result of him setting that up, that actually got bought out by an organisation many years later called Foundation Housing. And Foundation Housing, right now, present day, basically provides half of the housing to people in Leicester themselves. So, yeah, yeah he, was, he was very much a revolutionary type guy, very militant dude. And my mum's side of the family, um, we're linked to Arthur Wint. He was my great, great uncle. Um, so we have a lot of history on, on, on the Jamaican side too. And my family was the largest Jamaican family in Leicester at the time, and I think it still is. Wow. So, yeah. Okay. Now, it might sound like a bit of a strange question, but I had to ask it. Yeah. In terms of, because I grew up around all different types of people, all different, a lot of people from a Caribbean background, an African background. Um, what was it like growing up in a community with a large Antiguan presence? Did that have any significance on you? Um, I, I mean, at the t back then, I wouldn't, I didn't look into that too much because I was just a kid, you know what I mean? So I didn't really look into that, to tell you the truth. And it's quite strange because though we have a large Antiguan community here in Leicester, uh, my dad is the only member of his family in Leicester. So everyone else is back in Antigua, um, in America, mm -hmm. or in London. He's the only actual member of his family that settled in Leicester um, you know what I mean so back then I would I, I didn't really it wasn't something you're just a child not something I've really yeah, thought yeah. about yeah but yeah we've got you know there's Bernard Francis there's there's many other significant Af Antiguans mm -hmm. there's uh, Dennis Christopher uh, Bernard Francis he set up a travel agency um, that was quite successful for us as black people Dennis Christopher he's the chairman of Leicester's Caribbean Carnival he's also Antiguan and um, the Antiguan High Commissioner, he tends to come here a lot of the time. We're in the African Caribbean Centre right now, and he always comes here whenever he wants to put on events for the Antiguan community and bring them together. Like I said earlier, we're not going to spoil the book, but obviously you grew up in England, and um, you made this, you, obviously you didn't make this decision yourself because you were a child at the time, but um, you ended up in Antigua. Prior to that, how did you, had you been to Antigua before that? And how did you feel knowing that you was going to Antigua? Yeah, we went in, um, we did go to Antigua before that, just for a holiday. Um, and it was quite, quite funny because uh, I, I do remember one or two memories. I remember it was the first time I ever got bit up by red ants, the Antiguan red ants, they don't play. So I got, I got attacked by red tans when I went there on holiday and um, also when I was born up until about 12, 13 I had dreadlocks so when again when I went back to Antigua for holiday the first time um, there, was, there was quite a, a bit of uproar you could say in my family over there because again they were very much against Rasta and them thing there you get me so you know I think my dad got a lot of heat from his mum. Why am it do you them have dreadlocks fam and all them thing there? You know what I mean? <laughs> all of that played out. Um, so yeah, we went there on holiday before. Uh, we had a good time. And um, yeah, what, what was your second part so of the question? Initial thought, when you knew yeah. you was going when, to oh, leave in Leicester. When I knew I was going, I was vexed, bruv. I weren't happy at all. I was vexed because I was 14. So when you're 14, you know, you, you're at that stage where you, you're just exploring teenager business, you get me? So I was very settled in my secondary school. I had my network of friends. Um, I was very popular at school because I was um, very good when it came to sports, particularly track and field. I won all races, 100 metres, 200 metres. I was very good. So... Um, I was very popular and again at primary school I was considered like a, a strong dude and all of this kind of thing, a bit of a leader kind of thing. So I had my, um, my friendships and stuff. So when I knew I was leaving, I didn't really want to leave, you know what I mean? Because I was like, you know what I mean? What, what am I leaving? I've got everything here. I'm happy here. 
I didn't want to leave. You know, I'm going to have to make new friends, go to a new school. All of that was very daunting to me. You know what I mean? So, um, the only happy feeling I had in relation to moving to Antigua was the, 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 um, Loss. the understanding that I knew that my uncle had resources. Okay, all right. Yeah? So that was the, the good part. That was it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so obviously mm. you wouldn't end up at VC Bird and you end up where your family are from. Mm. Your initial thoughts in arriving in Antigua, do you remember that day and how it felt? It was bloody hot. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> it was bloody hot. It was hot, man. Um, it, it was hot and I just remember it was, um, you know, everything just smelled different. Um, the environment was, 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 very, was very super tropical and... You know, when I went on holiday before then, I, again, I was younger, mm -hmm. so I didn't pay attention to those kind of things. But when I went at 14 years old, I was much more aware of, of everything. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I remember. I remember this, it was very significant, smell, smell clean, you know, tropical. Everything was, was, was uh, just, just looked so different, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Well. From reading the book, it, very interesting things went down in Antigua. So, mm. for people that want to read the book, I think I think people should definitely read the book. It's a very very interesting story, but without giving away too much. Yeah. What do you think Antigua gave to you in terms of your or your time there? What do you think you took away from Antigua? I took away um, a fantastic understanding and bond with horses massive you know and um everything over there is different in terms of over here in terms of over here when it comes to horses and stuff you've got a lot of red tape a lot of blue tape over there it's just do what you want to do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i got to um work with these animals in a very unrestricted way you know what I mean and developed a really lovely bond with these animals and um, not only that I also developed a very streetwise uh, mentality you know what I mean in terms of I learned how to look after myself I also understood what real poverty was living over there um, and I understood the value of community over there, real community. Um, and not only that, I learned from my peers in terms of those I was surrounded by. I understood how to carry myself and how to be a leader, you could say, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and then also on top of that, I, I took away um, a fantastic uh, portfolio of education as well, because, you know, as much as my story is very interesting. Um, I understood the value of education and the education standard over there is, is higher than over here. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it still is. At the time it certainly was. And I done very well in school and so on, you know, considering all that I went through over there. So I'm very proud of the, my educational achievements and uh, yeah, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So some things happen in the book and you decide to return to the UK. Mm -hmm. Now, having spent uh, a bit of a chunk of the time there, how difficult was it readjusting to England? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't too difficult, but there were certain things that I uh, kind of made a conscious decision to keep in relation to certain things I picked up and learnt and experienced living overseas. You know what I mean? So, um, you probably noticed that my accent is still a bit strange, it's still a bit twisted, you know? Depending on who I speak to, <laughs> yeah. it kind of just comes out all kind of different ways, you know what I mean? So um, I still got that strong accent and stuff, but um, readjusting, it made me a very safe driver, I could say, <laughs> yeah? Because I remember coming back over here and seeing a double-decker bus and I was bloody petrified, like, you know what I mean? Because all the buses over there, they're like little minivans. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I when I first came back, I seen the double-deckers again. I was a bit, I was a bit wary, like, is it going to bloody tip over on me? And 
using the traffic lights and stuff to cross the road, I had to readjust it and all of that. Um, but it wasn't too difficult readjusting, you know, um, readjusting to the friendships that I had prior to leaving, I could say was, was a bit difficult because obviously we've all grown up now. Um, so I, I lost some friendships, made some new friendships. Um, I, 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 I forgot about certain people that I probably supposed to remember and stuff like that. You know, I come across people even up to now, like, oh, do you remember me? You don't remember me and this, that and the other. I'm like, I can't even remember you, but <laughs> stuff like that, you know? Yeah, yeah and maybe, maybe the clothes and stuff and the weather to an extent. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I actually wanted to come back to England just so I could wear um, more clothes and stuff, you know what I mean? Over there, it's just t-shirt and shorts all of the time. I got bored of that, man. I wanted to wear <laughs> hoodies and big coats and I wanted to experience winter and, and, and spring and, and, you know, as well as, uh, you know, the wind and the rain. It sounds strange, you know? We all want to run away from that when we're here to live in sunshine, but when you're living in sunshine for five years constantly and you, you was born here and experienced all of that, I actually missed it, you know what I mean? So that was a, it's a strange thing to say, but it's, it's, it's honest, yeah. you know what I mean? So, um, obviously you're back in England and you decided to work with horses. Um, what was the motivation in terms of starting to work with horses? Obviously you've de developed an affinity with horses and working with them, that was one yeah. of the main things. But I think it was a, in the book, there was a particular goal or vision that you had. Yeah. And what was that? Yeah, so, I found that um, I always loved animals, always loved animals, whether it was horses or any other animals. I've always had, had a strong connection with animals. And um, the horse side of things, it came, the reason why I took that so seriously was because I had a natural ability working with these animals and there's a particular um, experience that I went through with a particular horse, all documented in the book. Um, that kind of made me take it even more serious. And not only that, at the age of 17, I got my license to train racehorses in Antigua. You know what I mean? And I've done very well as a trainer, you know? And um, at the time, my whole ethos was that I wanted to come back to England to get equestrian qualifications because I had the experience, but I didn't have any equestrian qualifications. So I wanted to get equestrian qualifications so I could co go back to Antigua and um, upgrade my uncle's stables with horses, with branding, and literally to dominate the whole of the Caribbean, literally, you know, with this newfound knowledge that I would acquire from England, go back and literally apply it. So that was the initial vision. But things changed when I came back here and I, and I, I um, and experienced the equestrian world over here. My, my whole vision changed and, and stuff like that. So I know you went to a question school. Uh, how, this is something that's always, always raised because people want to know their experience, but what was it like being the only black student at school? It was, it was very lonely, super lonely, very lonely. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's the key thing, it was super lonely. It was very weird, it was very strange and I had to kind of find my feet and find my way. You know what I mean? I had to do much of that in isolation, by myself, you know what I mean? Um, adjusting to how people, teachers and so on, used to talk to me. You know, at times I would get confused in terms of thinking, are they taking a piss? Or are they genuinely trying to help me with something? You know what I mean? So I, was, I used to get very agitated at times and also the red tape and the blue tape over here, you can't do this, you can't do that, you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way, you need to wear this, you need to wear that. None of that applied in Antigua, so I had to kind of get used to following rules and stuff like that, whereas I was a person that used to make the rules, you know what I mean? So that was, uh, and also the undermining, that, that used to really annoy me a lot because I felt that because I was from a, such a different equestrian world, I felt that people used to undermine me a lot over here, particularly in the in 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 in, in the equestrian world over here, where it's very much white, privileged, and elitist, and you know, 
where the young people over here kind of think that they know everything about horses, you know what I mean? So they used to think that they had to teach me something or tell me something and most of the time... You knew already? I knew already, <laughs> if not better than the students, just better than the bloody teachers too, you know what I mean? And it was quite funny because when it came to handling the animals, it came natural to me. I used to excel at that. It wasn't a problem at all. You know what I mean? It's just everything else. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. come to come to one of the areas that I'm very interested in. You mm. obviously developed your company, and um, I like the way you've marketed it. It's open to absolutely anybody. Mm. Um, was there a particular passion to get working class people into the field? Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred mm. percent. Um, Again, you know, like I said, my experience at college over here, equestrian college was very lonely. Um, even after college, when I went to work in the world of horses, that was super lonely as well. So this is where my vision changed from wanting to go back to Antigua to um, set up and upgrade my uncle's race yard to actually wanting to do something about the lack of diversity over here. You know what I mean? Because... It just, it just baffled me as to why we was not able to access the equestrian industry, equestrian world over here, feel comfortable in the equestrian world over here uh, as much as we should. You know what I mean? I knew how much uh, horses played a role in my life and the therapy that they gave me in relation to everything I was getting up to outside of the world of horses in the Caribbean. They literally saved my life over there you know what I mean so I knew that with the, the you know when I come back to England and I reconnected with all my old friends it was very similar to what was going on in in, in the Caribbean in, in, in a way in terms of they're all they're all hustling and stuff you know what I mean and there's no lack of there's, there's a lack of ambition a lack of role models they're getting caught up in you know selling drugs uh, you know petty crime um, or the, the, the mindset is just limited to wanting to be a, a rapper or a sports person. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So limited. And I just felt that, listen, man, you know, I, I, I'm seeing Tiger Woods and I'm seeing Venus and Serena Williams and I'm seeing uh, more later Lewis Hamilton and stuff, you know. And it just goes to prove that it don't matter where you're from, if you give people an opportunity to experience mm -hmm. certain activities of certain worlds that they're not used to, they can they will excel, they can excel. So I thought it's, it's high time that the equestrian world stops mentioning Oliver Skeet. Because huh. all, all they do, you know what I mean? Every time they see me, oh, do you remember Oliver Skeet? I, I want to forget Oliver Skeet, you know what I mean? There should be more black and minority ethnic peoples coming through the equestrian world and being successful in the equestrian world rather than just being tokens in the equestrian world. So I thought that with my background, with my passion, with my vision, that I could do something about that. And, you know, I wasn't waiting on anyone to, 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 to give me to go ahead to do that. I had an idea and I thought, let's uh, try this idea and see where it takes us. I was fortunate enough this morning to meet some of the people who are on the project and I just wanted to know what kind, what kinds of people have you had attending that maybe there anybody that you expected that wouldn't attend and did actually start attending? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, that's a very good question. Right now, for in terms of the young people that you met today, mm -hmm. this morning, and the staff members, there were young people that come to our junior pony club. Now, our junior pony club, I would say right now, is our strongest service. So we have approximately eighty young people every single week that come to our junior wow. service. So we run sessions on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Sunday. We've got 18 kids on every day. It's totally fully booked and there's a massive weight in this too. Um, and it's, it's, it's strange because the, when I initially started it, it was, <clears throat> again, to get inner city communities involved. And that literally meant, like you said, anyone from the inner city. So we're talking faith groups, we're talking uh, African heritage community, the Asian community, the working white class, you know, communities, um, and so forth. Um, one of the shocks for me was 
we have many um, young people from the, Al from the French Algerian community okay. and the French Tunisian wow. community. And that shocked me because I didn't know they even existed in Leicester. Yeah. You get me? Yeah. So it all started, I don't even know how it, how did it even happen? Like, we had one French Algerian late parent who got in touch and she wanted her sons to, to start. And uh, said, yeah, no problem, we had space. Uh, they started and then obviously she's told her friends and her family, and it's just grown and grown and grown and grown and grown where we have a huge contingent of uh, French, Algerian, French, Tunisian kids. Mm -hmm. And it, it just brings such a fantastic um, dynamic, you know, to um, Urban Equestrian, to our pony club, and their first language is French, and you know what I mean? And we, we'll be on a minibus, we'll be up at the horse stables and you're hearing this French lingo and it's, it's just good because all of the kids they're from such diverse backgrounds we've got you know Rastafarian kids obviously Caribbean we've got mixed race we've got white we've got um, uh, Asian um, but we have these this French Algerian clique but even to add to that we also have um, young people from Yemen young people from Oman and I didn't expect that you know what I mean so um, it's, it's beautiful it's fantastic it's eclectic and it's just how we love it. We, we even got a young girl whose father's from the Netherlands. We've got a young girl who's half Asian, half Polish. Um, we got, yeah, the young girl whose father's from the Netherlands. She was born in India and she has a story in herself and mm -hmm. which is mixed race and it's just beautiful. Okay. Yeah. What do you think um, the biggest challenge you have overcome setting this up? Um, the biggest challenge of the biggest challenge I, I would say I've overcome setting this up is proving people wrong, yeah? Because a lot of people were saying, oh, it's not gonna work, this, that, and the other. Young people be interested in horses for a day or two, then they won't be interested, you know? Uh, I knew that was totally not the case. Um, the rate at which our services have grown has been quite incredible, um, to the point that, you know, we, we, we're on Sky Sports and, and, and Sky One and Good Morning Britain and all the rest of it because the impact that Urban Equestrian has had on the equestrian world, it's really shaken it to its foundations, you know what I mean? And that's, that's, that's what we want, you know what I mean? That's exactly what we want. It should be inclusive for everyone, you know what I mean? So I think that's the biggest challenge, but the challenges are still ongoing, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I wouldn't, we, we're no way near where we expect to be our ultimate goal is to have our own equestrian centre, equestrian academy. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say centre academy and not riding school is because the academy, though it will specialise in horses, it will offer other services that work very well with the equestrian industry. So we're talking, for example, we have a pilot program we're running right now, which is a combination of horse riding, employability and yoga, mindfulness. We have, um, me being an author, we want to be able to deliver through the academy creative writing. Um, we want to be able to deliver books, you know, publications. Um, we also want to bring on board sound engineering. We want to be able to teach history from an Afrocentric point of view. Uh, science, maths, English, so it literally is a school that we're looking to build off the back of what we've started. Sounds fantastic. Um, one thing, I was going to ask what's been the most enjoyable thing, but it seems like you enjoy seeing the development of people and, yeah. and lots of things going on. But one thing you said as we were looking down the road, and I realised there was a Caribbean Senior Citizens Centre. Yeah. Um, is that um, you're even looking to get senior citizens involved yeah, in it yeah. as well? Absolutely. You know what I mean? A lot of people, a lot of the interviews I do and stuff, a lot of people I talk to, they, they always mention young people, young people, young people. Now, young people are important, but I really question this for the whole community and communities. So, at the minute, we have four active programmes. Just to give you an indication, so we have, we have a mini-me programme a mini-me pony club, and that's for toddlers. So that's for three to five-year-olds. You have to be three to five. If you're six, you can't go. You know what I mean? Three to five, that runs every other week. That's picking up pace and extremely popular. 
We have our junior pony club in terms of the kids that you met. So that's for six to 12 year olds. We've just piloted, uh, two weeks ago, we kicked off our teenage riding club. So that's for 13 to 19 year olds. And then on top of that, we have, on the last Sunday of every month, we have our adult beginner sessions. So any adults that wanted to experience, you know, horse riding, working with horses, they can attend the adult beginner sessions. Um, <clears throat> and again, that's uh, picking up pace and is very popular. And that's for anyone who's never ridden before, or if you've had one or two tries on horses, but it's something you wished you could do on a more regular basis, but you was a bit reluctant to, because you didn't think you felt fitted into that world, then feel comfortable come and do it with us. Um, so to add to that, the last part of the puzzle in terms of covering all age ranges, you could say generations, is the Senior Citizens Equestrian Project. And that's simply where we want to be able to take uh, little ponies and so on into uh, care homes uh, so we can have the senior citizens interacting with the ponies, with the horses. Uh, and then also, where possible, to take the senior citizens out into the country, uh, which is therapeutic in itself, and uh, give them a chance to again interact with horses and ponies and uh, nature. So say to, for example, I'm a parent and I come to you and I say, in terms of my child, what would they, they benefit from? What would they gain mentally, socially, skill-wise? What do you think children or adults as well, of yeah. course, would gain from this? Okay. Uh, well, ultimately, you're going to gain uh, equestrian skills. You know what I mean? That's, that's the first thing and the most uh, obvious thing. If you're going to start riding, then it's uh, quite... Um, quite lovely to see the interaction between a young person or an adult who's never experienced uh, you know being around horses that much it's very interesting to see the interaction when they first come on one of our activities programs um, and then after they've come for a few sessions you know what I mean at first they're super nervous a bit um, agitated anxious but then after a few sessions you see how how they feel it's so normal they don't even think about you know any any particular worries that they had beforehand um so so that's really really interesting but um self esteem increased self esteem increased confidence um therapeutic if you have behavioral issues then you can calm yourself down um Discipline, focus. When you're riding, you have to apply a lot of discipline, a lot of focus, so you can take those attributes uh, away from the horse riding, horse interaction, and apply it to, you know, everyday life or to, um, you know, being in school. We have a lot of parents who praise us for the social skills that their children have developed as a result of interacting with Pony Club. Um, we have a lot of parents in particular with kids who have special educational needs who have uh, benefited tremendously. Some young people who um, access our services uh, have reduced their medication where they have um, ADHD and so on, autism. Some parents have actually reduced their medication and they, they credit Pony Club with the reason why that's had to happen. We have just had um, a school uh, that comes to our to our sessions on a Wednesday and they bring 15 young people um, from a particular area of Leicester they're, they're, they're mostly well 13 of the 15 kids are white working class kids and they come from a very deprived run down area of Leicester um, but all of these kids have been chosen and picked for a particular reason and that's because either they have special educational needs, they have behavioural issues or some type of um, issue, so to speak. And I had a meeting with the headmaster yesterday, not yesterday, last week, and um, he couldn't stop singing our praises in terms of how incredible, you know, the impact on those young people um, AJPC has been, which stands for Aziza's Junior Pony Club. Um, you know, to the point that 
this again was a, a subsidised funded programme for three months. Uh, but he now wants to uh, use our service on a regular basis as an alternative curriculum service where he wants to bring out a different cohort of young people from his school during school hours to interact with horses through our service up at the stables on a regular basis. We've also had two other schools get in touch, primary schools, uh, want to do exactly the same thing. So it's proven extremely popular, a thing is growing at a, a huge rate. And uh, yeah, again, you know, the adults, same thing. Confidence, self-esteem, equestrian skills, and, uh, and happiness, you know? Happiness, you know what I mean? Seeing all the smiles, therapeutic. Take them out of the concrete jungle, stick them in the woods, or stick them in the country. And um, it's, it's, it's such a difference in terms of seeing how free, you know, we are to just uh, to be happy and to, to get on with, 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 uh, with stress-free activities, you could say. If someone wanted to support the organisation, yeah. how can they get in touch with you? Um, <clears throat> so our website is www.urbanequestrian.co.uk. Uh, contact numbers on there. You can email us again through there. Um, my personal website, which I also have, is www.hoodtohorses.co.uk. Uh, so that kind of tells you more about myself rather than the business. But again, parts of the business is on that site as well. Um, so by your means, you know, we, we do um, all of these different services like I've mentioned, but I also do motivational presentations, uh, creative writing workshops. I've done nearly, uh, well, the majority of the schools in, in Leicester, I've done creative writing workshops at those schools, motivational presentations also. Um, you know, if you need someone to speak to uh, certain kids from a particular background or have particular issues, then I'm all for that kind of stuff there. So by all means, get in touch and, uh, you know, let's see how I can possibly help you, how we can possibly help you. That's what we're here for. This could have come from anybody, but what's the best piece of advice you ever received? Best piece of advice? Keep... Keep on, keep on keeping on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, and the second to last question, but the ultimate question is, what would you tell your teenage self? Again, that 17 year old self, if you could go back, what would you tell yourself? What would I tell myself? Um, what would I tell my teenage self? Well, it's a good question, you know. What would I tell my teenage self? Um, my teenage so it's difficult because my teenage again 14 to 19 I was in the Caribbean isn't it mm -hmm. yeah so I wouldn't really tell myself anything to tell you the truth I don't regret anything at all That's you know I, I appreciate everything that I went through and stuff like that so I wouldn't really tell myself anything I'll just uh, yeah nothing at all okay. and the last question is what do you want your legacy to be? And it doesn't have to be associated with your business. It could just be associated with anything. Mm. Leave it on your choice. What do you want your legacy to be? <clears throat> just that freedom was a real one. He was a real one. And um, he really put in that work. Definitely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, that's it.